It's midweek already. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to The Polls. We are coming to you live from our studios here in Accra. You can get us on digital terrestrial TV because we are free to air on DSTV channel 421 and Gold TV channel 144. This is Joy News, independent, fearless and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon on The Polls, fix the country movement in a coalition course with the Ghana Police Service. As the service reveals, the group requested to be allowed to stage a protest with private and security men for three days. This afternoon on The Pulse, we hear from the group Plus, get some reactions on this developing story. Not trust the police. If the police is giving us their commitment, that this time around they are going to be professional, that this time around they are going to give us the best of security as demanded of them, and not be shooting us, turning the guns that is meant to protect us, as against us, then maybe we can go to the round table and have a discussion again. And this afternoon as well, we'll talk about illegal mining as the Water Resources Commission is alarmed at how the country's water bodies have been polluted by illegal small-scale miners. Nothing really is. We all have kept quiet. Fortunately, if we don't do something about it, it's going to destroy all of us. And the race within the NPP is heating up as uh, the party says there's a renewed energy within the governing New Patriotic Party. Well, that's the assessment of the General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, John Boydou, who himself is offering himself uh, for elections by July this year. We'll bring you details here on the polls. They cherish their contribution and participation. You can see a renewed energy in the party. The enthusiasm that we see, we've never seen that before. There's more coming your way. I am Blessed Sugan. This is The Pulse. The Pulse, as always, is brought to you by Global Communities, Digni Lu, Affordable Safe Sanitation. This afternoon as well, we're streaming on all of our social media handles. It's at Join News on TV, also on YouTube. Twitter as for the hashtag, The Pulse. My personal handle is at Blessed Sugan. Always a pleasure serving you here on The Pulse. Please stay. Well, so this afternoon, the Ghana Police Service has revealed that the Fix the Country convener, Oliver Baka Vomawo, and his allies requested to be allowed to stage a protest with private and security men for three days. The service in a statement says this is unlawful and has the potential to result in a breach of public order and safety. Well, so what's um, the concern of the Ghana Police Service? You have it on your screens right now. Uh, first of all, the police is indicating in the statement that the Accra Regional Police Command on Sunday, May 29, 2020, received uh, the notice of intent to embark on a demonstration from a group of persons, including, and there you have it, Okatiche, Frifa Mensa. We have Captain Godspring uh, Smart. Uh, then we also have Benjamin Dako and Oliver Baka Vomo himself, who is well famed for Fix the Country movement. Now, among other things, the group is indicating that uh, the demonstrators intend to embark on a three day demonstration starting from the 4th of June which is a very remarkable day we'll talk about later on. Uh, but also, the demonstrators intend to contract a private security company to provide protection for demonstrators. But that's not all. We also know that the demonstrators are indicating that um, they would contract private security and these persons will be armed with weapons as well. And then the armed demonstrators will pick at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation and the Ghana Police uh, Headquarters. Now, we also know that at the GBC, they will demand to speak directly to the nation on the state broadcaster and then lay out the grievances that the group is having. And also, we know that uh, the group, as been uh, indicated by the uh, police service, is requesting that that security arrangement be made available to them uh, regardless of um, whatever provisions there are in the law. So the Ghana Police Service is indicating that it wants to assure the public that the police service is ready and willing to provide necessary protection for lawful demonstration in the country. However, in this case, the service is of the view that the nature and the character of demonstration as intended is inconsistent with the Public Order Act. Well, the Fix the Country group itself uh, has been speaking on the matter. They've been addressing the press a while ago on why they're making these demands. We can listen 
uh, to that address by Okatiche, who is one of the leading figures of the Fix the Country movement. We did not trust the police. If the police is giving us their commitment that this time around they are going to be professional, that this time around they are going to give us the best of security as demanded of them, and not be shooting us, turning the guns that is meant to protect us, as against us, then maybe we can go to the round table and have a discussion again. Until then, we are going to make sure we will protect our own self. Yakasa Amsa, Yokosukui Amsa, Yetungwa. Huh? What do you mean for What do you mean for Eti aye bua paye adi ano aye choko mo mukia tani aye choko mo mo no ense mo mo no mpesa gana phone mo mbedi eti aba o mo kose disaffection mo koko kanchi la gana phone se mranti ane ni lawless mo koko kanchi la gana phone se mranti ane kuwa ma mu future mo koko kanchi la gana phone se ni pabo ni phone eti swa ni no aye Machiavellian tactics they will do anything possible to separate the Ghanaian populace from uh, yeah, the leadership of fix the country which we should not allow yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. i always say that the reason this country is peaceful is because we are, not because we are peaceful country mm -hmm. okay. the reason this country is peaceful is not because of christianity mm -hmm. the reason this country is peaceful is not because mm -hmm. but it's simply because we do not understand what is going on around us yes. If we begin to understand that we vote for people to come and give us the social amenities like good roads, hospitals, but some crop for a job of Momoko hospital will be treated every now and then. A bad and why a colibri? A bad and why a car for you? The very moment you understand, said the entry of Muntimino roads for more than 10 years is because roads when you are the MPP chairman, the MPP NDC chairman be. Every year, we almost sponsor a year elections. We are from Betomoka. It was your road in nature. What yes, you can't any bill. The very moment people begin to understand, say, Kwame Nkrumah and Yansem were your motorway for 50 years. But some crop for a buyer motorway, and they say, Is that see a bad book? I ain't you know. They find a knee jerk reaction to solving the problems. Sebi Sebi, you say, Nippon in your tears, yes, yeah. And your bro and your bumper in front of the debut. So Nippon and tears here. And over the years, the media that is supposed to be uh, yet the watchdog for the people by putting the politicians on their toes, they have now become a guard dog for the politicians. Well, except of that uh, press briefing, which is just done some hours ago, and that's one of the leading figures uh, addressing the group there. But why June 4 and what's the implication for national security? Joining me now is Dr. Adam Bonai, security uh, analyst and expert, he understands what's happening uh, across the country. And uh, he's joining us to help us with some analysis on this doc. Thank you for your time. So first of all, uh, the demand for private security on the day of the demonstration. Is that justified, uh, given the accounts uh, that we're learning from uh, the police statement? Well, yes, uh, good afternoon, blessed. Uh, it, is, it is not justified, and it cannot be justified anywhere in any country. Uh, it's not allowed to, uh, you know, go on a demonstration of you know this nature and request that because you don't trust the state security apparatus, you are going to you know contract your own private security and arm yourselves because you don't trust the security you don't trust the security agencies. I find it very difficult to understand. But if you look at their demands, that has to you know if you look at their demand, there are some legitimate concerns there. It is how they want to achieve it. That uh, is a point of departure for me, and that is likely to throw this country into some, you know, uh, chaos. You know, and so as far as I'm concerned, the police, uh, the police's uh, statement, is, and the, the action the police is taking is okay. For now, until such a time that they refine their proposal uh, so that it's in tandem with the public order act. I think the police should be firm and resolute and ensure that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. You might, if you have a legitimate concern, find a perfect way of doing it. Uh, every country has its own peculiar and unique challenges. We are not different. And so as far as I'm concerned, uh, I would say the police shouldn't allow them to go on such a demonstration. Uh, there are no private security companies in this country uh, who are, uh, well, 
I think said, well, you could be armed with stones and, you know, cudgels and, you know, whatever, apart from firearms. But, you know, those of us who have led demonstrations in the past will tell you that sometimes you are in front and you don't know what is going on, you know, behind. And so they need to be very careful uh, with their demands. I think even in, under South Africa, the apartheid regime, uh, South Africans were not allowed to demonstrate with firearms and the kind of weapons they are lo looking for uh, to bring that down to Ghana, I mean, where we have been voting since 1992 to say things have gone so bad that uh, you want to take over, you want to address the nation using GBC. What is the significance? Anyone who knows the significance of GBC will tell you, I mean, growing up, Anytime you had the national anthem played, it doesn't matter the time. We used to only have GBC. Uh, you started fearing for the worst, and usually you would hear some rogue soldier telling the nation that they've taken over. Is there a declaration that they, they want to go and declare that they've taken over the nation? Mm. I don't know, but I think that uh, the Fix the Country campaigners would have to come again. Uh, and, and, I, and, I guess, uh, and I guess, Doc, that the date itself um, is quite remarkable. The fact that um, th there's a lot that went on in terms of our political history. June 4, as we know it, represents something very critical, a, a landmark situation that happened in, in this country. So uh, perhaps that, that could also be informing the perception that you're forming about the situation now. Yeah, exactly. June 4th, I was there. I mean, June 4th, I was old enough to have seen June 4th and seen how many people died. Seen, you know, uh, what happened on, on that fateful day. I don't know how many of them, uh, you know, were born on that day. And so if they are purporting to want to celebrate June 4th, it's not a day, uh, you know, I would want to see, uh, you know, young people celebrate because then people lost their parents. Uh, you know, people literally just vanished under the surface of the earth in this country. And so mine is that they need to be very careful what they are calling for. Probably, I don't know, I've seen some older folks amongst them. Maybe they might have seen June 4 from another angle, but I, I mean, grew, growing up in Tema, it happened right in my backyard. And so I don't know what they are calling for. And I'm expecting the security agencies to ensure that this country doesn't go back to uh, the darkest of days that uh, some of us found ourselves in. Anyone who is as old as I am and lived in, especially where these schools started from, will tell you what we went through. So I don't think uh, they know. And majority of probably the young Ghanaians in this country don't know how it feels when there is school. They don't know how it feels when there is political instability. They don't know. Anyone who understands these things will want to shy away from I don't think, uh, you know, if you look at the recent census, it tells you that majority of them probably didn't see mm. the, the, the coups as some of us saw it. And so, right. So, so you, you, you believe that this is not a good time to allow them to pour out onto the streets. But just hold on for me briefly. Okotiche himself is joining us via phone right now to explain uh, their concerns to us. Uh, it's good to be talking to you at this time, sir. First of all, June 4, what's informing the, the selection of that date for your planned protest? Um, thank you very much. Uh, June 4 is a day that we all can at least understand that it resonates with the people when it comes to cleansing of our democracy. Obviously, we've gotten to a point where we see that thieves have captured uh, the state uh, using the power of the people to their own advantage. And for that matter, to remind us of the very things that actually led to the June 4th Revolution 1979, we needed to pick that date as a symbol that we, the youth of this nation, we are not going to sit down for certain people to use the people's power for their own advantage at the detriment of the masses. So it's just a symbol that you and I know. Mm -hmm. 1979, J.J. Rollins got up, cleansed the system. We are not going to clean the system by using the barrel of the gun, but we simply wanted to remind ourselves of what happened due to the impunity with which the people are using the power of the people. That is why we chose the, 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 the June 4th. But unfortunately, as it stands now, it coincides with Yen and Anomo, uh, guard, the guard traditional uh, council, the uh, ban on drums and other stuff. So
So they have also pleaded that if we can change the date, they are willing to support in numbers, but we should just change the date for them. So we've reconsidered that, and we will communicate that to the police by close of day today, by putting it next week on the Friday, mm. uh, so it does not coincide with that of the current traditional leader. Okay, that's fair enough. But then are you also backing down on your demand to have private security protection um, on the day of the demonstration? You see, the whole conversation about having a private security and having arms was our best way of bringing attention to the fact that the police service, which changed from force, that is supposed to protect the people. Over the period with impunity, the level of impunity with which they use the force, the, the, the power of the people, to abuse the people, killing them in Nigeria, killing them in Nkwanza, killing them everywhere when they are going for demonstration. So it wasn't as if we actually believed that we are supposed to carry arms or we are supposed to hire a private security. But we wanted to highlight to the public the fact that the police that is supposed to protect us for a period now are killing the very people they are supposed to protect. So if the Ghana police service is assuring the people that this time around people can freely go for demonstrations without being killed, without being shot at, then what would be the need for us to carry arms and also have private security? So we are saying that the Ghana police service who is supposed to serve us should stop killing innocent people when they decide to embark on demonstration. If they can give us that assurance, then we wouldn't even have a conversation about carrying arms and uh, having private security and all that. Mm, uh, and some this is a case and, and where the Ghana uh, police service actually wrote to us and told us that they cannot allow us to go for three days demonstration. We asked them, on the basis of what law are you saying you cannot allow us to go for three days demonstration? So right away, we cannot trust that the police can provide security for three days demonstration. They are saying they can do just one day. When they do the first day and they go away, who should be there to protect the citizenry? Obviously, it lies in our, uh, uh, in our bosom to find security for the people that will come out in their numbers. Mm, uh, and so, uh, if you, yes, if you for instance, some experts are raising concerns already about that uh, planned protest. Uh, Dr. Bona is still on with us, for instance. He's talking about the fact that if indeed you want to relive the moments of June 4, this should not be the way you should be marking such an event. Well, everybody is entitled to their opinion, and I respect his opinion. Even if I don't agree with the opinion, I would defend his right to say it. What we are saying is that it is not the fact that we believe when you are going for demonstration, you must carry arms. When you are going for demonstration, you must go for private security. We believe that the Constitution has provided avenue for protection of citizenry when it comes to embarking on demonstrations. But here lies the case we cannot trust the current police service to give us the kind of protection we want without turning the guns on us and killing us. So it was our way of drawing attention to the public that it is enough that the police will be killing citizens who are only exercising their democratic right. So if the police have gotten the attention and is telling us that they are going to protect us, then the conversation about we carrying arms and having private security doesn't even come in at all. We only wanted to highlight and draw the attention of the people mm. to the fact that it is enough. The police can no longer turn the barrel of the gun on the people mm. who are only exercising their democratic right. Right. And, uh, okay, Tiche, this question keeps facing you as a movement. To what end are you pursuing this Fix the Country campaign? Uh, because for some, it appears that um, you've peaked in terms of your demand. The whole country knows what your concerns are. It appears that We'll just have to wait to see what the leaders will do about the need to fix the country. So what's more in this new resurgence? I think this is an uncharted course, okay? I quite see a tearful moment when we're going to the farm. You get to a point, you see that it's a thick forest, but you have to create a way to get to the next stage. So that what next, sometimes I don't even understand why people ask us. I see every uh, movement that came about has to end up forming a political party or, or somehow. Look. There has been so many movements across the world which never ended up in political party. So if people are asking, I understand that they sometimes want to know if we are going to form a political party. As I sit here, I do not believe that the current situation we find ourselves in as a people, with the current constitution, any political party, third force can thrive. So I don't believe in that. 
I believe we must change the system that will give a yet direct representation of the people the appropriate chance to represent, represent themselves without going through this political party system. We have the, the uh, 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 proportional representation system in South Africa and other places where independent people can represent their people without going through uh, uh, political parties mm. where it is hijacked by certain cabals. So I understand when people ask to what end is fixed the country thing going about. They want to hear whether exactly. we are going to form a political party. As it stands now, there is nothing like a political party being formed in our coffers or in our corners. We are only telling the people to fix the system that they have created that is weak, that is about to collapse. And you see, my brother, what we are doing, we are only saving a situation. Uh, but, but we some, are redirecting the energy argue... of the youth towards a proper cause. Other than that, we will end up having chaos on our hands if this system breaks without any direction. Mm. That is what we're trying to do. Uh, but some also argue that you are radicalizing the youth. What is wrong with radicalizing? Marcus Gabi once said, radical is a name given to anybody who endeavors to free the people from bondage. Jesus Christ was called radical. George Washington was called radical. Kwame Nkrumah was called radical. Robert Mugabe, Muammar Gaddafi, all these people were termed as radical. Even Nelson Mandela, who is well celebrated at some point in the history of this world, was classified as a terrorist by the United States of America. So for me, what is wrong if people say we are radicalizing? If there is nothing there for you to radicalize, you see, whatever energy we are touching on is something that is there already. If the people are angry, that is what we are exploiting. If the people are sad, that is what we are exploiting. If and it the, is and not that's, there, and we won't get any so, Sorry for, for cutting through, but that could be dangerous, particularly as the intelligence services are warning that there may be terrorist exploitation in the country. So why not tone is down it, is it, is it on, more dangerous on the than stealing from the people lands that are meant for the next generation? It is it more dangerous than killing nine people when we go for elections? Is it more dangerous than enacting laws anyhow to impoverish the people? For how long can we continue to sit down and pretend that what we have is what we call democracy? And for that matter, nobody should speak otherwise against it or it will create chaos. If it will create chaos, it simply means that the people are doing something wrong and they are afraid that we will enlighten the youth to understand what is going on around them. So we are yet there, yeah. Obviously, when we even enlighten the youth, nothing will happen. You are not doing something right. You are impoverishing the people. You are stealing from the people. Using the so-called law mm. to protect yourself. Siphoning the people's money. Siphoning the people's work for the past 30 years. Particularly under this government, we've never seen any corrupt government. And when you look at what is happening now, the level of impunity with which they do the things they do, then you know that 1979 people were killed for less. If you look at the impunity with which this government, particular family, that is siphoning, using their state resources, state apparatus, creating special purpose vehicles, siphoning the monies and the resources of the people, taking it away from these people onto another country. Then obviously people were killed for less. So when they say we are radicalizing, we are sorry, radicalizing. I'm sorry, what I'm are sorry, they but, afraid of? But I'm if sorry, but, but that's, that's hate speech. Uh, I mean, you're basically inciting uh, the, the pop populace uh, against um, a group of persons who you're, you don't share the same belief with. Uh, but just to wrap up with you, in fact, I'll bring in Dr. Bona shortly, but just to wrap up with you, there's the concern about what would happen next Friday. You're spending three days on the streets? Is that what we expect? We are spending three days on the streets forming a human barricade protecting the Achimota forest, and we are sending that as a signal to those misleaders we have currently that under no circumstance would we sit down and allow any group of people that we've given our sovereign power to to use that same sovereign power to impoverish the people and steal and capture the state from the people. We will not allow that. For that, we will not allow. I hope it will be peaceful. That's all we are praying for, I guess. Under no circumstance are we calling for chaos. And like I said, the only reason we placed that in our statement to the police was to tell the police, Jack, and we, don't, we are not afraid to say that. So if the police is saying they will protect us, we will peacefully have that demonstration for three days and we will go home. That is what we are saying. Okay then. Uh, I'm thank you very much. And I'm sure that you have to run for your show, but thank you for joining us. Dr. Bona is still with us. Uh, Doc. You heard the explanations from the group, the concern about how partial, quote-unquote, this um, Ghana Police Service leadership is. It's increasingly becoming a concern for the group. Uh, 
are they justified in the in the explanation that they are giving us now? Well, they haven't. They are not justified, not at all. I mean, how justified can they be? I am sure, even under the current police dispensation, they fix the fix the country campaigners have gone on demonstrations. Correct me if I'm wrong. How many of them were shot? How many of them were beaten with horse whips? I don't. I didn't see that. And so they are completely out of order. I mean, I probably, like I said, uh, most of the leaders of the fifth campaign movement uh, don't know how June 4th unfolded. I don't think they know. If they know how June 4th unfolded, and the fact that what June 4th, uh, you know, came, you know, to do, literally, we didn't get that done. Uh, the country didn't, what, what, what did we achieve? Before June 4th, I mean, I grew up in Tema. We had all the factories in Tema. After June 4th, all the factories have been sold. Tell me. Even in some Canary, it was sold. And so for me, we, yes, we have a challenge as a nation. But to any attempt to take us back to those days by people who probably didn't witness how June 4th unfolded, I find that very worrying because then... If you say you don't trust the police, therefore you are attempting to create a parallel, what do you call it, a police organization. Which country does that? It doesn't happen anywhere. We only have one state, uh, you know, police service or force. And therefore, whether uh, you like it or not, that is what the law says. Mm. If it is not good, we can advocate to get it better. But this type of advocacy, where people should front the street, if you are going to have three days of continual demonstration, you would be impeding on my rights. The fact that you are going to go on this demonstration three days, I don't know which streets you are going to use, but assuming for three days, I have to use a certain route, and I'm, I can't use it because you are demonstrating. Don't you think I have a right to? So I think that they need to tone down you know, and, and re-look at you, re-look at how yeah, they but, want but, to do but I guess um, to toning them. down, but Doc, I guess toning down would not necessarily uh, lie with the leadership of Fix the Country. How about government as well? How about uh, the intelligence agencies and also the Ghana Police Service uh, de-escalating by negotiating with leadership of the group? How about that option? How, I mean, how do I negotiate with you when you come to me telling me this is your, I mean, if you and anyone who has done negotiations will tell you that you would have, you know, hard, you know, negotiators. They come to the table. They don't really come to, to the table to negotiate. They come with, you know, a position and you take it or you leave it. And so if they had gone in to say, you know what, uh, we want to demonstrate. These are the options. But if you come in and say we are coming in for three days, we are coming in with private security, as far as I'm concerned. The Ministry of the Interior is the only institution in this country that is mandated to grant private security licenses. And I am aware that they do not grant private security licenses that comes with firearms, mm. that even comes with pepper sprays, that comes with even tasers. So if you say weapons, I mean, that is very vague. What kind of, I mean, it, well, the moment you say you are going to be armed, I mean, water can actually even be, water can be lethal. Uh, do, you, do, you agree can to be that, lethal. The, do you agree to that increasing suspicion that this group uh, is gradually becoming extremist? Oh, well, I, looking at, you know, their statements and what they put out there, yes, I want to, I would want to partially agree, but it would be very difficult. For, can, for Ghana to live with extremists. I have to be, I mean, looking at who we are, anyone who doesn't understand where we have come from will tell you, I mean, they should go and read history. It will be difficult to be an extremist and live in this country because the point is that, uh, I mean, it is easy to fish out a Ghanaian in the United Kingdom, in, in US and the rest. It's because of our demeanor. So any attempt to, you know, uh, form extremist group would be very difficult. Initially, some of us thought, I mean, uh, the Fix the Country campaigners had a point. But where you begin to go, you know, overboard, then it becomes worrying for us because then, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, your, your network is actually even saying that those who want to even go on vacation to the United States of America, when you apply, 
you are you are given 2026 to come for an interview that would not actually even guarantee you a visa to go to the united states if you wanted to have a vacation or even medical uh, treatment if you wanted or do something education it tells you that increasingly we need to get our country better so a lot more of us i would want to live here i wouldn't want to go anywhere so anyone who would want to take me hostage in my country i'm sure i would have a legitimate right to fight back and so please tell uh, our brothers and sisters from who formed the fix the, uh, the country campaign movement that you know what there is that there are legitimate ways of doing these things but the hard you know stance they've taken would rather create more problems you ask them what is the way forward are you just go what 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 are you expecting i mean i mean do you want to throw the 1992 constitution into the you know toilet and flush it excuse me to say what are you what do you want what is the end game the end game is you want to you know cleansing the ghana police service then you will have to go in there mm. and put all of them on the electric chairs kill all of them so 19 i mean 1979 i was around i was you know i was old enough a lot of people died a lot of people died businesses people lost their businesses people lost their homes did that cleansing this country it didn't so mine is that we have a constitution that is not so good that you know we can work on and make it better we have a democracy that we are practicing 2024 we will go to uh, the polls we would have to go and elect some leaders just recently the mpp had their internal politics internal elections mm. some lost so basically and, you're, you're suggesting basically you're suggesting that if they have grievances they should channel that through the ballot box i guess yes if you if you look at there is this uh, young man who one of the leaders in south africa can't remember his name uh, you know this young man he has his own group can you mean the efl name. malema malema good malema has his members in parliament malema has his members in parliament they mount the, the podiums, they do other things, but they are also putting in, you know, modalities, putting in measures to ensure that, you know, they become part of the governance space of this country. What is Fix the Campaign Group want to do? If I want to join them, if I want to be a member, am I just going in and wearing red beret and red t-shirt, Fix the Country Campaign, and hitting the street and demonstrating? For what? So please, I think that the security agents, the, the intelligence setter, should be up and doing. Mine is that we are surrounded by very hostile countries. That are, when I say hostile, I don't mean the leadership of those countries. By, I mean countries that are under Sahel. I mean, they are getting bombed every day, people getting killed. Therefore, anything that will draw in, you know, inspiration, to get anyone to come in or people within to take advantage of us, I think they would have to be up and doing and mm. deal with it. But as far as I'm concerned, if some of the uh, issues they raised, for instance, uh, he's talking about issues of corruption. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we from since the, the days of Corona era to today, we've, there's been corruption. And so mine is that you can't say because somebody is corrupt, you are going to... Uh, do the June 4th start. It's not going to work. I mean, mm. I, I, June 4th right. would not happen in Ghana. So, kindly let the, fix, the, the, the country campaigners know that they should use legitimate, uh, you know, uh, measures okay. to do whatever demonstration. And I'm believing that the Ghana Police Service, they are supposed to protect us internally in this country. Mm. If they allow some of these things to, to, to take place, it means that they are largely going to undermine uh, some of us, our freedom to move around freely. You All can't right. say, I want to demonstrate three mm. days in a row. Okay, I don't then. think it should happen. No. I'm afraid, Dr. Buna, we'll have to end it here. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us, uh, Dr. Adam Buna, security analyst, uh, security expert as well, joining us to share his thoughts with us. Let's talk about Galamsey. The Water Resources Commission uh, has warned that illegal 
induced uh, illegal mining induced pollution of the Bia and Tano rivers are uh, actually assuming alarming proportions similar to the levels that triggered outrage from neighboring Côte d'Ivoire in 2017. Executive Secretary of the Commission, uh, Ben Ampoma, says the data available indicates disturbing turbidity levels of the two water bodies. Well, he was speaking at a two-day uh, transformational dialogue organized by the University of Energy and Natural Resources in Sunyani. These footages show a distressed, highly polluted Ofin, Enuru and Tano rivers in the Ashanti and Western regions. The images drew sharp reactions from MP for Ahafuano Southeast, Francis Menu Adabo, representative of the Buno Traditional Council, Nana Kufi Bidiako, the Buno Regional Minister, Justina Ousu Banahine, and technical advisor to the Lands Minister, Ben Ai. When I see these things, I ask myself, who are behind this? Because we try to fight this cancer and it keeps going up. I can't buy excavator, but the ministers and the MPs, you can do that. So we are saying, The implication of these artisan miners, and as we saw from the documentary, whether they have permits or they don't have permits, they both have no mercy upon our forest and our water resources. The critical thing really is, we all have kept quiet. Fortunately, if we don't do something about it, it's going to destroy all of us. The Water Resources Commission says Ghana is getting close to creating a rift with Côte d'Ivoire due to the increasing pollution of the Bia River which flows through their treatment plants. 2017, uh, our activities upstream with respect to uh, mining polluted the river to the extent that they could not treat the water. So they had to shut down their water supply systems and that created some, what we hear, uh, upheavals in terms of protests from the communities. And if you look at the stability values of the beer getting over to the thousands, which means that it has the potential to create that level of pollution where they may find it difficult to treat their waters. And it's our only hope that we can begin to, as it were, address the situation to prevent the situation where we may have that potential, you know, transboundary conflict. The two-day dialogue is expected to come out with a communique on fresh solutions in the efficient management of small-scale or artisanal mining in the country. Professor Elvis Asaribidiako is Vice-Chancellor of the University of Energy and Natural Resources, Sunyani. The aim of this two-day transformational dialogue, therefore, is to present the opinions of various stakeholders on key issues in order to formulate shared goals and priorities and define the modalities that will enable a sustainable practice of the artisanal small-scale mining in Ghana and Africa. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Buna Region. New research has revealed 26% of delegates in the Ashanti region doubt the new patriotic parties break the eight agenda to retain power after the 2024 elections uh, will happen. Now, respondents cite the government's failure to complete projects under the one million per constituency initiative as a major impediment. The grip of the party in its political stronghold is also threatened by outcomes of the recent uh, party elections at the polling and constituency levels from the polling station to the regional level elections. Uh, 
factions uh, have evolved with some aggrieved persons seeking redress in court. Nana Yaojima has been focusing on the efforts to deal with these cases as re-elected regional chair Bernard Enchi Bosiako launches an agenda to break the eight. The research by Dr. Smart Sapon of Kumasi Technical University ahead of the NPP's delegates conference accurately predicted a 57.8% of ballots cast for the incumbent Bernard Entribu Siakon, missing that of the closest contender by two percentage points. Part of the research also revealed some party delegates fear that breaking the eight agenda is unachievable. Only 73% of Ashanti region delegates believes the MPP can break the eight. What it means is that about 26% of delegates, not floor, common floor members, so the delegates that are going to influence the common floor members, if the delegates, 26% of them do not believe the MPP can break the eight, hmm. then it is the first assignment for the regional elected regional executives. They are to bring their delegates to the level of believing Believing we'll, that they can we'll break the, the, the Ashanti region has since 1992 voted in favor of NPP, contributing 71% of votes to the party's victory chalked in 2020. But some party members believe internal wranglings could affect the fortunes of the party in the next general elections. Many pending cases in court are challenging elections in constituencies as the Alternative Dispute Resolution Committee of the party makes efforts to clear these cases. Bernard Entribo Siakon, who has led the NPP in the region to two elections, promised party members to fight towards strengthening the grounds in the region. <laughs> But deep cracks in the grassroots of the party may deny the party of its vision. Four out of 47 constituencies were denied voting rights at the regional delegates conference due to court actions, among other reasons. Credibility of elections in other constituencies is being challenged. Secretary of the Elections Committee in the region, Henry Kwabna Kukufu, says appropriate action is being taken. We do have what I term um, issues of conflict management, resolution management strategy. We know how to manage it. We know that um, issues will arise, but when they come, how do you tackle them and how do you manage them? So in our own wisdom and the wisdom of the National Party, we will come together, form um, or the reconciliation committee in earnest and bring everybody on board. After the regional delegates conference on Saturday, the party activated its reconciliation efforts. Leaders are expected to put the party together towards attaining their objective to break the aid. Osei Che Mensabunsu is majority leader in parliament. I, I, I think we can break the aid, but a lot will depend on how, how hard we commit ourselves to working to salvage that cause. It is not just by lip service. We must hit the ground, you know, we have our boots on the ground and work and work very hard. Meanwhile, in finding a lasting solution to the problem with internal elections, there are calls for expansion of voting rights for all registered party members. Akwesi Osei Eje is aspiring national chairman of the party. The delegate system doesn't help. So if everybody is voting, then they are part of the decision making, then it reduces that. Whoever wins, this is something I will push as a chairman, that we should make every card-bearing person vote. That will take away the delegate system, because the delegate system is no good. How many people did they consult before they came here to cause their votes? No. As internal party mechanisms are being triggered to deal with the divided front, the agenda to break the eight will largely depend on unity of party members. For Joy News, 
na na yachima kumase also let's broaden the conversation and speak uh, to dr smart sapong he's a political science lecturer and research fellow at uh, the Kumasi Technical University, who actually put together the report about breaking the eight dog. How did you arrive at the conclusion that even NPP members themselves, um, some 24% of them, doubt if the party will break the eight? Yeah, uh, blessed. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we extend our greetings to all our viewers who are, who are watching us this afternoon. Uh, a quick correction. Uh, I'm not a political science lecturer. Okay. I'm a statistician and a senior research fellow. Uh, I'm the director in charge of research and innovations for the Kumasi Technical University. University, right. Yeah. Apologies Usually the short no. form is, yeah, sure. The short okay. form is KS. TU, but right. usually I think I, I see how, how I see I see how passionate you are about your uh, organization. It's it's really yeah, good sure. to hear about that. Uh, but first, let's let's zoom into the uh, findings that you've made and how you arrived at the conclusion. Then, great. Um, I wanted to find out based on the heat in the system. If Ashanti region was a little hot in respect of the regional elections, so I took interest as a social science researcher took interest and I wanted to find out from the base those who were going to vote uh, as to how the dynamics were and the ultimate aim of the party seeking to break the eight. Uh, as part of the breaking the eight exercise I sought from them who they think would best lead them to break the eight and that is how come I got my findings which I shared on who was likely to win the uh, elections, which was actually confirmed exactly the elections that just ended. So as part of that exercise, I wanted to know whether those at the base, the constituency executives themselves, were uh, of the belief, they, they actually support the belief that the MPP can break the eight. And uh, I was thinking all of them would have said yes, but surprisingly, 26% uh, do not believe that the party can break the eight. Mm -hmm. They, of course, would assign several reasons, some of which uh, would be placed at the doorstep of government in respect of some uncompleted projects that they think would make the cost to breaking the eight a little difficult. Mm -hmm. Some to uh, internal issues peculiar to various constituencies in respect of the imposition of candidates on them, Sometimes they feel they who are constituency executives have been sidelined and some individuals have been empowered beyond the party. Then they will sit back and then watch what that person will do. So they personally do not believe. 73% uh, believing they can break the eight is good. It's a good percentage. But I think the work for the just elected regional executives will be to up or elevate the belief of all constituency executives to that level so that at least we can uh, uh, think that they would work based on what they believe in. But if they are mm -hmm. going to work based on what they believe in, then I think 26% would work to uh, scatter while the 73 right. work together. Uh, and given uh, the findings that you have, are you able to project how deep-seated this perception is? Uh, even amongst um, other members of the NPP, uh, as well as um, grassroots supporters. This is the base, or supposed to be the base of the NPP. So if you're having such sentiments, are you able to project how widespread this is with even float floating voters within the Ashanti region, for instance? Yeah, it, it, it should be, in my view, I mean, I don't have data to back this, but I think that uh, if you have a factor of 1.6, uh, we don't have half human, so I can say two, then then it is easy to uh, assume or estimate that these views as expressed by 540 delegates can represent twice the constituents they represent. It is assumed that these are the most popular people selected to lead the, the constituency. Mm. They have share of the total constituency vote. It, roughly 17 per constituency, uh, each of them have two, a share, two percentage share right. of the constituency. 
kind of. Then the rest will be based on the work they will do. And then others too may vote whether you convince them or not. So their share of the constituency votes itself is somewhere around 35%. What I mean is that every constituency executive would have a two percentage influence on the constituency. They are 17 in all. So all the 17 executives put together can garner 35% of the votes that will be uh, up for for grabs in, in, in any given election. Mm. Per uh, their individual uh, influence. So, so if something needs to happen for you, what should be the priority of Chema Wuntumi, who has just uh, won his re-election bid? And, and it appears he has started quite well. He needs to unite the funds. He really, really needs to unite the funds, else this 26% would widen. Mm. So somebody told me today that if I should go back to the field, it is likely the 26% would increase to somewhere 30 or 35%. But, I mean, much would, much would depend on how intensive he goes about his unity mm. uh, talks, try to unite all the fronts, and then go down to constituency by constituency to uh, encourage them, to motivate them to bring up mm. the, the spirit, bring back the love, so that at least when they get to the point of believing, you know, it's one thing believing and one thing uh, the thing coming into realization, but at least it starts with the right. belief. The assumption is that if they believe, then they will work hard towards what they believe in. Mm. So they really have a lot of work to do. Let's see how uh, that develops in the coming days. But Doc, I'm grateful that you've been able to uh, explain the figures and the dynamics to, it, to us. Thank you for joining us. There's a lot more happening on the uh, NPP front. In fact, the race for the national level is uh, heating up as the former Director General of the State Interest and Governance Authority, Stephen Asamoah-Boateng, says his connection with the grassroots of the New Patriotic Party, uh, his ability to reach out to uh, disgruntled members and uh, flair to bridge the gap between government and party makes him the ideal person as chairperson of the New Patriotic Party. According to him, the party's desire to break the eight will remain a mirage unless competent and dedicated people are elected to serve. At the launch of his chairmanship slots, as Amar Barting said, he will ensure the empowerment of the party faithful uh, to play very good roles in the future of the NPP. Permit me to expand and share with you my seven key points that I've taken all over the country and people have administered to me that these seven are key to our survival and to break that eight. Number one is that I will work to restore the party unity and strengthen the relationship between the party members and our government. Yes. That's number one. Yeah. Unity has become an overused word by most people without backing it up with any track record. I have governed, I have proven track record of pulling people together to achieve a common goal. I demonstrated the, this during my news days, that's the National Union of Ghana Students, against the ruling military dictatorship. And while we were in exile in the United Kingdom in Abidjan, I helped organize the young and the elderly to push for the referendum that ushered in the 1992 constitution. As immediate director general of SIGA, I provided the leadership that ensured that all CEOs worked together as a team. This resulted in the creation of the chamber of CEOs of all state entities. I promise to bring this to bear in my leadership as chairman of our great party, and I will work hard to bridge the gap between the grassroots members and our government. <laughs> party people that went into the trenches to win power must feel that our party is in government. Yes. Members must be motivated to get our morale at the highest level in order to face our opponents in the 2024 general elections. Number two, I will work to strengthen our party structures. Each party officer must be assigned specific responsibilities with resources to, to, to deliver. 
Well, uh, I caught up with General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, John Buidu himself, who's racing against some four others for the national secretary role of the New Patriotic Party. He says there's a re-energized um, feeling within the New Patriotic Party and that he will do all he can to break the eight for the NPP. Today, uh, we know that you've started the official campaign. Um, what are you seeking to uh, achieve by the media launch that you've done? I just wanted to use the opportunity and the platform to inform our team in masses, party officers, that having successfully organized polling station from the structures of our party, from polling station, electoral area, constituency, and the regional elections, 15 out of 16 of them have been successfully uh, elected and also being able to do that on the external branch elections. Very soon, the National Party will open nomination for prospective aspirants who want to be national officers to put in their bid. And I'm using this opportunity to also inform them that their own John Boyd, the General Secretary, if the National Party opens nomination, I will decide to contest to continue as the general secretary of the party. There are many party um, faithful who are wondering why you decided to take the early step, I mean, being the first to, to do that. Well, it's a strategy. Others are already campaigning. And, you know, a heavyweight boxer weighs his punches before he throws. Uh, they've been out there. Uh, as a party and running this process for a very long time. At a goal, I should let, because sometimes people call to ask whether I'm contesting again or not. If I decide to go to constituency by constituency, it will take time for them to know that I'm in the race. That's why I decided that, why don't you, having done this, let everybody know that you are, in, you are contesting and that you'll be visiting them in their constituency and their respective regions as well. And are you confident that you'll be able to secure their mandate once more? Yes, I'm confident, but not complacent. Uh, because uh, it's a delegate elections and you must be able to sell your message to the delegates. I'm confident because of what I bring on the table. Having worked in this party across almost all levels, polling station, constituency, region, and national, and also held vital positions that are necessary, training grounds to be able to run as general secretary over the period, and also taking over the party at a time that the party was in serious crisis, managing the crisis in the process, win elections, both for parliamentary and presidential, going ahead to help government to also put its government in place for years, going to another election, winning the presidential election with the help of my executives. I think that at this time when we obviously will be having new presidential candidate, new running mates, Manasha Chema will not contest again, you talk nice. Then DC will have been happy for me not to contest again because they will see an entirely new executives competing with them. And that will be difficult for them to lend the ropes within a very short I think uh, Fred Owari made a profound statement that after the uh, uh, national elections in July, you want to start the process of electing presidential candidates. If we are in government, it takes three months. If you are in opposition, it takes six months. So, your newly elected national officers, it will take about two, three months for you to put your act together, for you to organize national council to take a decision and start the process. So the earliest you can start the process around September, October, there about or December. If you are not lucky and the number of people contesting are more than five, you need to have a special college elections to shortlist the number to five. 
uh, if you have somebody who is not experienced, who doesn't understand the process, it may take us almost a year to complete the process of electing a presidential candidate. We still have a it means that you have just about six months to go into an election, such a critical election where in this country over the years, every political party in government spends only eight years. What it means is that you need to do things differently. And I have been part of this process and I know, without thinking, I know when is the time, what to do and what not to do, you understand, with regards to presidential, with regards to parliamentary and all that. So in his view, we think that if not because of democracy, people should not be even dreaming of wanting to contest me as a democracy. And thanks for staying with us here on The Pulse. We'll return shortly with more. Please stay. And you're welcome back to The Pulse. Now, residents of Jetoko in the South Town district of the Volta region are appealing to the Volta River Authority to consider the construction of a bridge across the Volta River, river uh, which runs through parts of the community. Uh, connecting uh, to the district capital has become a challenge for residents. As they say, the river is filled with dangerous weeds, making even river transport in the area very perilous. I was in the community over the weekend, and this is what I found. We are here at Jetokwe. It's a riverine community in the South Tong constituency. Well, residents here say they're facing a challenge crossing from one side of the community to the other, which leads to the main Sugakopa municipality. The concern is that revelers find it a hard time and a tough time crossing over. Some have had to pay more money or plead with some benevolent individuals to steer them across and ferry them through with this canoe which I'm on right now. Part of the concern emerging here is that the weeds are gradually growing which is making even the river transport more of a danger to residents here. It would be easier for in and out if you had a bridge. If you had a bridge because without a bridge Sometimes people can come uh, and stay at the overbank whilst the canoe is here. And they'll be there several times, unless someone is coming, oh. is crossing to the other side before the person can see. So, and if. Ask the authorities? Oh, several times. Anytime they say, oh, we'll do it, anytime we'll do it. But sincerely speaking, it has become like something, it has become national anthem to them. Because any time, anybody that will come, we say, we'll come and do it, don't worry, it's not anything. But several, I haven't heard from them. But what is your appeal to them? My appeal to the authorities that they should seek us because we are also Ghanaian and we are, we are part of Ghana. We also vote. Every four years we vote. So at least they should look at us, not one way or other, so that we should also find it uh, easily in <laughs> Go income. Oh, I'd be all a I'd be a toddy de la Hamaganaka, Pomo Yemu, a total hamil of Fupe, Tammy de Ku, and near me here, Pepelemuna, or Bridge Nemi, me de Kunemipa, I'd be all a food de la me, Togi, a cata, coy, Togo do Gamacata, Mialisima, going be two Kurema, Makutok of Aipo, Katok Makuvaya, a Kun for Donimia Toko, ye a Kamidule Toko, Kafi Aqua Tolaga, no, no, Jitoka Toka. Manya no ne amarisa ra kule toko. Alba nyata fanya makoba te fai kana ni le fufula ya egbe fanya ole nufu donami. Alba gafu faroli na sisi yova ina sima egbe hamu ole egbe mukpo mono atuto. For so many years since um, 2006 that way that we started facing this problem. Uh, what were you told? Anyway, we made a follow-up. You know, the VRA normally take in charge on our water bodies. We have consulted them severally. 
But uh, what they told us that uh, they will come and move the water hyacinths for us. But here is a case still. We did not see them. So will the authorities hear the call and the plea of these community? And will they come in fast to aid residents of Jetokwe? Until then, I am Blessed Sogan reporting for Joy News, Jetokwe. Well, let's take you to the Upper West Region now. Please, uh, there uh, have given indications that they've picked up uh, one individual in connection with the public flogging of a woman and her male lover. Well, the two were picked up by some angry youth uh, who tied them actually to the poles uh, at the Wana's Palace. The story has been trending over the past um, 24 hours with that very striking video which has uh, flooded social media. Let's uh, speak now to Rafiq Salam, our Upper West Regional Correspondent, with the latest uh, on this matter. Rafiq, thanks for joining us. Um, so what more can you tell us about this? Um, the latest that we have on this uh, issue is that um, a certain young man uh, who is a mobile phone repairer and whose name has only been given us, uh, Bushuan, uh, has been arrested uh, by the war police uh, in connection uh, with that matter. Uh, he was uh, picked up a couple of hours ago uh, by the war police and it's happened uh, in the investigations. But the police at the moment are also still searching for uh, some of the guys that I've seen uh, on the v video flogging the two love beds. Uh, but, I mean, ever since the, the video went viral, a lot of questions have come up, particularly one regarding what accounted for the strokes, <laughs> or the lashes, if you'd want to call them that way. Is it because of the filming of, of that intimate moment, or perhaps there's something we're not really aware of? Um, somewhere around 2021, um, the area, so let's say the war township uh, was inundated with uh, several leaked sex uh, videos. Hardly a week uh, passes uh, in the municipality where you see uh, two or three uh, videos in circulation about leaked sex tapes. And so the overload of the Wala uh, traditional area, now we've seen the city people, the pub, uh, held a meeting uh, with some of the subjects and also uh, some religious leaders. Uh, to deliberate on the issue and to find a lesson, a solution uh, to them. Uh, so one of the ways was to have uh, these religious uh, leaders uh, going to uh, their mocks or also the church using a pulpit uh, to preach against some of these things. And also, uh, they also talk about punishing those people who are involved in that particular act. And so they warned that uh, should anybody be uh, caught in that act, that person will be uh, severely punished. But they didn't come up with the method or the kind of punishment that they are going to give to uh, that particular personality. And so, fast forward, when this issue of a uh, uh, sex leak uh, tip uh, came to the fore on Monday, and so they have uh, some young men mm. uh, in town who also went on their own and then also to arrest uh, the two loud birds and then took them to the one as palace. Uh, and, 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 and there's also a question, part. and Rafik, there's also a question about the one as palace as to whether or not the overlord himself was present uh, when the flogging was taking place. The overlord was absent. Uh, he was not around the palace. He was nowhere. He had uh, other meetings outside the palace when the incident occurred. He only returned to the uh, palace somewhere around uh, 5 uh, p.m., uh, uh, talking about in the evening. But the incident happened five hours after uh, he came back uh, to the one house palace. I was at the palace yesterday uh, in the evening uh, when uh, his spokesperson, Na Jibreel uh, Naka Ibrahim, when he was briefing him on what actually transpired uh, at his presence. And the one I was really shocked uh, to the morrow and then learning about what transpired uh, at his palace. So the one I was not there. It was this young man who, uh, upon the instruction of some a uh, few people around the palace who ordered that these two young men uh, should be uh, flogged. Initially, they said they should be given 100 lashes, but later they said that since they were first time, first time offenders, mm. uh, they gave they released it to uh, 20 lashes each. But okay. even the 20 lashes, they couldn't even execute it because about nine, nine or just 10 lashes that they, they, they gave them. I, I, get that. I guess that was a moderate one. <laughs> but um, how about the police service? 
Um, the police service are uh, um, at the moment they said uh, they are investigating uh, on the issue. Um, the police earlier yesterday uh, stated that they were supposed to have a meeting uh, with uh, the, uh, the 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 what do you call it? Some key personalities at the one as our palace, and so they were expecting them at the police station this morning. But the one I contacted uh, the crime, the crime officer and the person of assistant commissioner of police, uh, Reynolds uh, Bantel. I uh, told me that the one I had informed them that they had uh, also they will also be having a client meeting after which uh, they will uh, come up for that meeting. And so they were then waiting on the uh, the overall of Wala Kingdom for them to have a meeting to finish uh, that meeting before they will also uh, meet these personalities and also uh, mm -hmm. to see uh, the way forward. But the police we are assuring the public that the persons who are involved in that act, all the all the young men who are uh, found on that particular tape, uh, you know, uh, flogging uh, these two uh, labels will be uh, severely uh, dealt uh, with. Okay, then. Uh, we'll wait to see what then happens. Rafiq Salam joining us uh, from the Upper West region. We bring you back to the Great Accra region. Residents of Teshi in Accra are still struggling to cope with the effects of the recent Floods, one of the west uh, to hit the areas in Teshi, where the bridge connecting the township has been destroyed, making people struggle to go about their normal activities. In the following report, Joy News uh, looks at the impact of the situation and how it's affecting people of Teshi. In almost every rainy season, Accra floods. Even though the government has in so many ways tried to control the situation, it is still clear more needs to be done to help solve the problem. Residents of Teshi say they are struggling to cope after the recent floods in Accra. The destroyed bridge in the community has added to their woes. Um, due to the road rockings, each and every time if I'm going somewhere, I have to walk all the way from here to La Scala to board a car. Because when I join from this end of the road, which is mobile, the traffic from here before you get to the police station is too heavy. You have to walk all the way from here to La Scala to join the car from that place. You find the bridge that I know where I will find them. And you soon will be through us. I have a and you have a film. I need a motor. Now, to all the bridge from from you said, I'm going to find bridge that we are as far. Commercial drivers and others who ply the roads have to divert to find new routes to their destinations. But as said by the contractor, contractor Business owners in the area complain that ever since the roadblock, sales have declined because their customers use other routes. Customers used to pass by each and every morning to purchase our products here. But due to the blockage of the road, they are not able to use the road again. Even cars and pedestrians as well. So if it has brought us a big loss to the pharmacy at 7 o'clock, the place is open and customers can be to buy. By now, it's, it's, it's almost 9 o'clock now and customers are not coming. Blockage or the, the falling down of the bridge really affected us here because uh, the customers, those who are using vehicle, 
motorcycle, they no longer come here because there is no way for them to pass. And now to education. The Center for National Distance Learning and Open Schooling, or CENDLOS, will for the first time hold a national digital and distance learning conference in Ghana. CENDLOS is holding this event in collaboration with the World Bank, UNESCO, and with support from UNICEF. The conference will seek to re margin Ghana's education sector by harnessing the power of digital and distance learning. This, when it's done, will lead to the establishment of a national open distance and electronic learning framework. In studio with me now is Nana Jinfi Ejabo, Executive Director for Sendlos. Definitely he'll be helping us out to understand what it is that his group is seeking to achieve with this conference. Nana, it's good to see you here in our studios. Let's mm -hmm. start off by understanding what you do at Sendlos. I mean, when we talk about Sendlos, what do you stand for and what, what do you seek to achieve? Okay, thank you so much uh, for having me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I greet the first gentleman of this nation, uh, President Nana Adudankwa Akufuado, and his able Vice President, Dr. Alhaji Baumia, and also my venerable uh, minister, Dr. Yaose Aduchum, yeah. for their vision for education. Right. When it comes to St. Laws, uh, our duty is to infuse ICT into education, yeah. to make sure that uh, there is technology-mediated learning in yeah. education. So that is our duty. To do that, we have to advise, package, and control anything online education. Yeah. So that is the duty of yeah. uh, St. Laws. Yeah. But then in terms of uh, open and distance learning, I mean, it's something that uh, some of the working class here in Ghana are well aware of, but when it comes to the general population, it appears we don't have too much education on what open and distance learning is all about. Tell us about that. Very good. So that is the role of St. Laws again. Okay. You know, when you look at the country, mm -hmm. uh, the, the perception when it comes to open and distance education, somebody might say that education when it comes to distance learning mm -hmm. is to go to school mm -hmm. only in the weekends. Right. But it's not that, it's technology mediated school, mm -hmm. whereby you leverage on technology to achieve the same learning that you would be achieving in the traditional setup. Right. So that is what the St. Law setup is all about, mm -hmm. to make sure that we educate the public to understand the importance of digital and distance education. So we are mandated to do that for the Ministry of Education, and our minister is very bold and dependent on that for us to achieve that. Thank so you. is it the case that um, Looking at what we have now in terms of uh, various institutions and how they run these projects and, and uh, various faculties across the country, how they run this open and distance learning education, would you say that is something we need to reform or perhaps there's a need to just maintain what we have? Very good question. That is why this conference is about. If you look at the system now, uh, St. Louis is the, 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 the national level that make sure that uh, distance education is okay. being achievable. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the other universities, other private colleges, mm -hmm. everyone is doing something uh, in the sort of distance education. Okay. So we need to bring them together. We are going to act as the referee to bring everybody for them to know that there is an agency under the Ministry of Education to handle that. That is what we are calling. And then we understand this conference is leading to the establishment of um, national a national framework. Yes. What, what would this framework achieve anyway? Okay, again, uh, uh, like uh, I said earlier, if you look at the digital education space, mm -hmm. there are stakeholders. We have the public sector, we have the private sector, we have the industry and academia. Right. We need to come together to exploit that space to make sure that everybody understands what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Because right now, technology has taken over education. Definitely. So we need that framework to guide us, mm -hmm. to make sure everybody knows what they're supposed to do, where there, there are synergies or collaboration, we come together and see how we can sustain some of the initial initiatives that we have in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if there's something really uh, emphasizing the need for this conference that you're doing, it would definitely be, for instance, the COVID-19 pandemic. It's yeah. exposed um, the weaknesses and some faults within the educational system, particularly when it comes to virtual and distance learning. How crucial will this um, forum be to addressing some of these shortfalls that we have within the system? Yes, again, very good. Let me give a background about okay. St. Louis, mm -hmm. what we used to be doing. Mm -hmm. 
St. Louis started uh, from 2002 as a PSI, that's President Special Initiative. Okay. During that time, we were given the mandate to advise, package, and control anything distance education. We were doing content creation at that time. And uh, in 2010, the name changed from PSI DL to Center for National Distance Learning and Open okay. Schooling. Mm -hmm. And we came about with two crucial initiatives, that is the iBox and the iCampus. The iBox is an offline learning management system. When we say something is offline, it does not use anything Internet. technology. Right. And the iCampus is an online version. So to, to, to tackle your question, you know, uh, when it comes to technology, mm -hmm. as we speak, we need to leverage on uh, initiatives to achieve that. And that is what St. Louis is pushing for us to do. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the system now, people are doing a lot of uh, initiatives. We have to make sure that we lead the front. Mm -hmm. That is why we are calling for this conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I guess you're not limiting this to just those working within the educational sector. There's the concern that, for instance, you can go as far as bringing in private sector, including some of these telecommunication networks as well, um, because sometimes when it comes to the use of internet, we know that they are critical providers. How are you robing this multi-stakeholder dimension Good. To into whatever it is that you're doing to achieve your Good. purpose? To achieve uh, uh, a distance education in the country, there are four major pillars that we need to uh, focus on. Mm. The first pillar is policy. You need to look at the policy that governs a student, policy that governs teachers, mm. even parents and uh, administrators. Mm. So we will need a policy to govern that digital learning space. Mm. And that is something that we need to take a look at in the country. If you look at other countries like China, uh, Singapore, in the USA, they have a policy for digital and distance learning. So that is one thing we need to look at. The other one is infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That is what you ask. Right. Infrastructure is in terms of connectivity, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, tablets. We need to make sure that there's connectivity for everyone. If we are talking about using digital education, we have to make sure that there's inclusivity, there is equity in education. So access has to be given to everyone, mm -hmm. irrespective of location. So right. connectivity is also one thing that we need to look at. Mm -hmm. And the third one is content. Okay. Content is very crucial. Mm -hmm. With the blood of distance education is content. So we need to make sure that there's uh, relevant content, mm -hmm. content that is within, within what is allowed, a standard. Mm -hmm. And the final one is capacity, that is training. Mm -hmm. So we want to bring everybody together. And the training is crucial as well. Let me highlight on that. Okay. Teachers need to be trained. Mm -hmm. When we are talking about digital education, we don't want to make sure that we miss the standard that traditional we were achieving. So we need to make sure there's capacity building. The teachers receive training okay. and the training has to go for the teachers, even the students, to know how to leverage online to study. Okay. You don't want to move students from a traditional setup online and miss the standard or the quality and the delivery of learning online. Okay. So you want to make sure that they receive the kind of training that will make sure that standard is still achieved. Right. The whole thing is uh, you are migrating from a traditional setup to a new economy. Technology is an economy, so you are migrating there. There has to be rules and regulations and other stuff that has to be achieved. So we need to give them the requisite training to achieve it. Okay. That is what we are pushing. Okay, then. And um, in terms of distance learning itself, uh, what's the status across the country? Uh, and um, is it the case that you, we have more and more persons opting for that option? Yes, uh, again, that's a good question. You know, the introduction of uh, COVID-19 has brought us to this uh, area of distance education. Right. And at first, before COVID-19, mm -hmm. distance education was still in the country, but it wasn't dependent as it is now. Right. As of now, majority of private sector and public sector, they are all doing distance education. And the general perception before was, oh, if you achieve a degree online, it's not as strong as uh, achieving a degree in a traditional setup. Now, because of COVID-19, a lot of people are now moving or gravitating towards online education. 
which is very crucial because if you look at other countries, if you look at USA, China, and uh, Singapore, yeah. they have been able to do distance learning for some time, yeah. and now they have achieved great results. And Ghana needs to also do that. We need to make sure that we deepen the distance education requirements and everyone should be able to achieve yeah. some sort of degree. And also we will give equity to everyone, which our um, Article 25 of our Constitution talks about educational right. Education is a universal right. It's a human right for, uh, uh, for everyone. Yeah. So we need to make sure there's equity, irrespective of location. Yeah. If a child is in Brewa, if it's a child is in Yendi, if a child is in Kumasi, any yeah. other place, yeah. they should be able to receive the same quality education that a child in Accra or Kumasi or any other place is receiving. Yeah. So we want to make sure that equity in education is being achieved. Yeah. That is what our minister, Honorable Dr. Yose Dichum, wants us to do. Yeah. That is in his quest to transform education to make sure technology is part of it and it forms an integral part. Interesting. Uh, so we need to go, but then who are we expecting to chat this course of, I mean, coming up with the framework eventually? Um, are we expecting that the minister would join himself and, and wh wh who else are you bringing on board to achieve this purpose? Very good. The minister is a three days event. Okay. So we will have the first day, it talks about the journey so far and the minister will be there. Yeah. It talks about the journey that impacts the success and the failures of distance learning in the country. So the minister will join at the first day to hear all this. And the second day, that talks about the evidence day and the tech solution. The evidence day is about, okay, if we are talking about send loss, yeah. what we have done, yeah. the iBox, the iCampus, yeah. and maybe UNICEF will talk about learning passport. Yeah. What have they all achieved? Yeah. Bring us the evidence. Yeah. The country wants to see data. Yeah. What is do, uh, distance learning doing? What is technology helping people to achieve great results? So we need to see the evidence during the conference. We will discuss that. Yeah. Then the tech solutions is we have locally uh, tech uh, giants companies in the country. The great technology that a country have is what you locally have. It's not what you are bringing outside. That could come and support it. So we need to give the platform for other tech giants and other incoming tech solution persons to also showcase what they have. Yeah. The minister wants us to give them the platform so they will show made in Ghana stuff. Yeah. Then the final day is the future, the sustainability plan of online education. Yeah. How do we sustain online education in the country? How do we assess to make sure that students are really achieving great yeah. results on yeah. online? Yeah. All these are stuff that the three days will focus. Yeah. And we have the minister, the deputy minister, we have a lot of individuals and persons, institutions, organizations yeah. Yeah. coming together to join for us to discuss distance education and the future for it. The public sector is coming, the private sector is coming mm -hmm. and also we have the other uh, telcos joining because right. you made mention about connectivity we need Definitely. the telcos so we will yeah. discuss that looks impressive i'm grateful for thank your time you so nana much. thank you All for right. joining okay. us well uh, it's been more than three months uh, since the start of that war in ukraine and germany's uh, big turnaround on its uh, security and defense policy as a result now uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, has addressed uh, Parliament in Berlin for the first time since then. Well, his remarks come at a time that uh, he and his government are under pressure to de deliver on the promises they've made uh, to their allies. Well, let's get more from William Glucroft, our correspondent uh, in Berlin with our partners, Dotti Vela. Uh, William, thank you for your time. So what did Olaf Scholz really have to say? Well, they're debating the budget this week, so there's a lot of domestic uh, issues going on, of course, but it's a, a huge stage, a big spotlight, an opportunity for both the chancellor and opposition figures to present their ideas and their criticisms. And of course, Ukraine is taking center stage and Germany's defense and security policy. Olaf Scholz, of course, took his time to essentially reject criticisms that he is not speaking up enough, he's not speaking firmly enough, that his government is not acting enough uh, in support of Ukraine. He said that uh, the goal of the, his government is that Russia loses the war, that Ukraine wins, and that only Ukraine and Ukrainians can make decisions about their future. And to that point, Germany is not it will be in a supporting role, but is in no position to dictate terms of how this war ultimately ends. 
Now, um, he's also talked about all the weapons that Germany has been delivering and future weapons that they're going to deliver, including uh, heavy tanks, including um, air defense systems as well. This was specifically to push back against criticisms that Germany has not delivered enough weapons or the type of weapons uh, that Ukraine has been wanting. So this is these are some of the things that, of course, Olaf Scholz is mounting a very strong defense of his government's policy when it comes to Ukraine uh, and beating back the Russian invasion. Just how much uh, has really changed about Germany's uh, sta um, I mean, standing as a world power since uh, this war actually began? Well, it's very much a matter of perspective and expectations. When Olaf Scholz made his big Zeitenwende speech, this big turning point, historic tur turning point for Germany back in February, shortly after the war started, there was some people who interpreted it as being about Ukraine, supporting Ukraine, uh, specifically fighting this war, uh, helping them fight this war against Russia. But other observers note that this was really about long-term security uh, and defense uh, issues with Germany, that this 100 billion euros that uh, Olaf Scholz wanted uh, to, to basically stock up German defenses uh, was not really about Ukraine. It really doesn't do anything for Ukraine right now. It's about giving Germany a stronger defense posture going forward and being uh, more of a committed partner when it comes to its NATO allies, because NATO, uh, NATO allies have been criticizing Germany for a long time for not pulling its weight given the size and the amount of money that Germany uh, has available to it. So that's really the change we've seen in the last three months. It's so far been a lot of talk, uh, but just this week we saw uh, an agreement between the government and opposition parties on how this 100 billion euros will be borrowed and will be spent, uh, and that's what uh, uh, needs to be passed. And, and that's when the proof will really be in the pudding if Germany has really changed its defense policy. And I'm just wondering what sort of uh, further policy action uh, we might be seeing next. So Schultz is promising more weapons, heavy weapons, which is what's been um, which, which is what's been demanded both from Ukrainian officials and from uh, members of the opposition here in Germany. He mentioned about air defense systems. He's mentioned about working more with allies and partners for these so-called round robin exchanges, where third countries will deliver tanks, for example, and then Germany will replace that country's tanks with tanks of their own. So kind of a, a three-way exchange, if you will. And then again, this 100 billion euros is the big question. How exactly it gets spent? Right now, it's looking like something of a creative accounting trick to get Germany on paper to that 2% goal that NATO has for spending on defense. However, this is a huge amount of money, but it will end at some point. And the question is, when this 100 billion euros has been spent in four or five years, what happens after that? Will Germany continue to stick to these commitments of higher defense spending? That is something that we will have to wait and see. And of course, that comes after uh, next elections already, so it's not the current government's immediate problem. William Glucroft with our partners, Dr. Villa. Thanks for staying with us here on The Polls. We'll return in a moment. Well, and that's all we have for you uh, here on The Polls. My name is Blessed Sogan. Don't forget to log on to myjoyonline.com. We have updates for you there.